I think you, you should just do it. I mean, there, there are uh, people that uh, I'm, I'm sure have, uh, especially here in Silicon Valley, have the ambition to start something on your own. Right? You're sort of in a very friendly environment. It's an environment that's very forgiving. Um, if you uh, make a mistake, you always have the opportunity to go back and, uh, mm. and do something else. So, uh, yeah, don't, don't pass up a chance. If you have a good idea that's worth pursuing, I think you should take the plunge and, uh, and uh, I wish everyone the best. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, and uh, I am the serial entrepreneur that's also the uh, founder and uh, CEO of Miller IP Law, where we help startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. And today we're going to go through another uh, great uh, journey of, uh, and I'm probably going to slaughter your day, but I'll try my best. Is it Karithic? Karith or Karithic, maybe. Karthic. There we go. And I'll probably still slaughter, but anyway. So yeah, he has a he has a fun journey. He spent uh, quite a long time in the semiconductor industry. Um, Works for uh, Amtel for a bit, then went on to another startup that was a uh, I think it's Flick or or something near that. And then um, from there, he's now kind of moved on to uh, Smart Edge. I think is where um, they are doing kind of uh, and then they and all sorts of star bootstrap startups and that. The current one is more of a uh, smart sensor, what I would call, or where you have a uh, sensor technology where a lot of the processing is actually done at the sensor level instead of on the back end. So um, I'm sure I slaughtered that introduction and didn't do it near <laughs> amount of justice, but I did my best. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's good to be here. Hope you're doing okay and staying safe. Yeah, doing good, being safe, and life is good. So appreciate you coming on. So I did a, I didn't do the the introduction near the amount of justice that what you did, but maybe if you can take us through a bit of your journey, we can uh, start there. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Karthik Karthik Rao, by the way, uh, founder of uh, Flick. Uh, SmartEdge, by the way, Devin is is a, a product line within. within oh, okay, Flick. that's right. We're launching the the sensor product as a separate brand. Okay. Um, in any case, my, my background, as you mentioned, is in semiconductors. So I started off my journey in uh, the telco industry. So I uh, built some chips for, uh, for optical networks and network processors in the beginning. And then uh, worked a couple of other gigs and then ended up at Intel uh, with a, uh, a gig for uh, a company that we were incubating within Intel. So we spun that out in 2006, which is sort of my first brush with, uh, with being a part of the core team of a startup. So you, um, not, and I'm already diving in. You didn't even get very far in your story. No, but, yeah. So you, yeah. you moved over to Intel and was the idea that, you know, Intel hired you on and you wanted to work on a, a company and they happened to spin it out. Was he, in, I guess back in, was the intent that you wanted to be part of a startup and Intel happened to spun it out or just get put, put on the project and then it got spun out and you kind of had being a startup thrust upon you? No, no. Uh, the, the idea was to work in a smaller group inside Intel. So it, it wasn't intended to be part of a, the core business. Mm. So Intel Capital incubated businesses at that stage uh, within Intel. So this was one of the businesses. They were actually doing something cool, which was doing, uh, they, they were trying to figure out a way to use Wi-Fi for sensor networks. So uh, it was a cool project to work on. So I knew what, what I was getting into. Uh, it was a startup or building a startup within a large company. Uh, which is which is quite interesting at that time. So I I, I sort of knew that the spin out sort of happened uh, organically. Right? Uh, Intel was in the uh, process of jettisoning some of the businesses that were not core to them. Hmm. Um, so uh, a year or so before that, they sold some assets, uh, and and sort of we were in uh, in, in that uh, sort of zone where uh, we're not quite core yet, and we weren't big enough yet. So it just made sense for them to to let us go. Um, so. Uh, it worked out nicely for us. They invested in the company and they helped us bring in some some additional investors. So we raised a fairly decent Series A and then we spun out in 2006. Okay. So uh, it was a really good experience. As I said, first uh, you know first experience for me as being part of a core team of a, of a startup, which is uh, a good learning experience. Hmm. So did that for about a year and then uh, Atmel, my previous employer, before I started the, uh, the startup. Uh, they recruited me to build uh, their business in India. So that was pretty interesting as well. Another sort of uh, semi uh, or, or uh, pseudo startup, you can, you can say, uh, mm. building a, a business within Atmel, uh, but essentially without uh, a lot of the risk that goes with building a startup. So it was 
So you almost, you kind of got the best of both worlds in the sense that you had the backing or the, the support of large companies, whether it's in, Intel or, at, or, at, or Atmel. And yet at the same time, you got to be the best of both worlds if you got to work with the cool technology and be part of the startup. So I think everybody needs that gig where you have the, the support of a big company with lots of money and yet you got to be part of the startup and do all the fun stuff. So that's cool. I know it was, it was too good to pass up. So it was, it was great. And in my sort of in, in that stage of my career, I was already doing some general management stuff and technical management for a while. So it was really uh, a right time in my growth to, uh, to get that sort of an opportunity. So I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, we built the company basically from zero to about 120 employees in, mm. uh, in three years and then uh, moved uh, to the Bay Area in 2010 to, uh, to lead a, a microcontroller group. So back into R&D and business after doing some general management work for a while. Um, so there, uh, when I was at uh, San Jose uh, uh, Atmel office, so we were building a lot of low power processors. So that was sort of, again, my first introduction to IoT. Hmm. Uh, we did a number of cool and, projects. And for those that don't know, inter- IoT is Internet of Things or make or interconnect everything. Just for those that are less uh, uh, familiar with the acronyms, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so we were working with sensors and low power processors. So that um, uh, was really interesting. Built that business uh, for uh, for about four or five years. Hmm. And then in 2015, uh, found an opportunity that again was too good to pass up. So I left and started uh, Flick. So that's uh, that's basically where uh, where we are today. Um, the company is about five years old. Uh, spent the first two years or so just building the IP. So I am gonna I'll, I am gonna jump in and I keep interrupting you, so apologize. But um, see, so you were at, at or Amtel and uh, or sorry, Atmel, and uh, you you decided. So it, it kind of sounds like you'd almost jump between big business and then you know startup and almost big business and startup. And at, yep. at least now you went to Flick and you kind of left the, the big company backing your startup and decided to go in your own way and start your own startup. Is that right? Exactly. That's right. That's right. So what made, so, you, yeah. decide, what made you decide to finally fully jump ship or go and do something fully out on your own as opposed to working within the big companies and, and spinning off startups and doing that? What made you kind of make that switch or make that jump? I think it was the idea initially. It, it, it basically was a systems idea. It wasn't really a semiconductor idea. Um, so I, I didn't think that there would be appetite within uh, my previous company to actually do a project like that. So it, it was a pure semiconductor company. And hmm. It wasn't the right, uh, uh, they weren't in the right um, area uh, to so actually. Did ever, so did you ever go pitch them or see if they're interested in the idea? Or you just said, hey, this is an idea. I just want to pursue it on my own. Or how did, and, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer that question. I have one more follow-up question, but how did you kind of, or, you know, did you pitch them? Did they were interested? You said, want to do it on my own or how did that work out? No, I, was, I was part of the management team there. So I sort of knew uh, what would uh, sort of interest them. Right? If I had a semiconductor idea, I would certainly have gone to them, but this was more of a systems idea and we were working purely in the industrial IoT space. So the, the intention was to do that. So uh, it was quite clear to me at least that uh, this had to be either Sort of done on my own, or I had to go out some, you know, to some other company to do this. And the, this sort of itch to to start something was was always there, and I was just waiting for the right opportunity to do it. This just seemed like it was a big enough market to go after. So, um, and I'll ask plenty of questions, but one more question. So, how did you kind of come up with the idea, or you know, how did you originally say, hey, here, here's my next stage, or here's what I want to do? How did that kind of genesis happen? Yeah, it's a bit of a technical answer, but basically the, the prevailing architecture at the time was big database, right? So everything was in the cloud and we have all of our stuff in the cloud. Uh, Which for most people, they have no idea what the cloud means. They just know that the data goes somewhere, it gets stored somewhere, and it magically gets, or it gets figured out and sent back to them. That, that's right. So it, it's just some offsite storage, right, where, where all the data resides. And the initial uh, industrial IoT products were all cloud-based. So you had this big uh, artificial intelligence tool sitting somewhere in the cloud, uh, ingesting all of this data from, from the sensors. And we at Atmel were on the sensor side. So we were designing these devices, pushing data into the cloud, and building mm. the monitoring systems. Um, so the idea really was to take a subset of that intelligence and push it into, the, into these uh, small devices. So it, it, it's called edge computing, but basically it was sort of uh, picking up pace around that time in the 2015, 16 timeframe. So the I'm idea gonna is- try, I'm gonna try and break that down for people yeah. that are less technical and we'll see if I, how good of a job I do. So right. 
sensors you can have, whether you have ones on the watch, you know, like let's say an Apple watch and you have a sensor on the bottom that can me measure your EKG or you can measure your heart rate or whatever, or you have internet of things that may measure everything from temperature, it may measure pollen in the air, it may measure any number of things. We have all these little sensors on all those different devices that can do something, right? The general architecture is, okay, we have these sensors, we'll take the debt, we'll make the sensor stupid, right? And the sensor will just take the measurement, it won't do much more of it, and then it'll send it uh, off into space somewhere, and they'll do all of the process, use that data, all the measurement data, and make some sort of an analysis. And you're saying, why do we have to send it off into the cloud? Why do we have to send it off somewhere else? Why can't we bring the intelligence back to the sensor and make that smarter so that the, the sensor can actually do a lot of the processing there as opposed to having to send it off somewhere else? Is that yeah. about right? That's that's perfect. Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better. Um, so that, that was the core idea. I mean, why why send all of this data? Right? Our sensor, for instance, it, it generates about three gigabytes a day. Now imagine if you have thousands of these in, in the city, uh, mm -hmm. you, you don't want terabytes of data going on your, your 4G, 5G network and clogging up the uh, the bandwidth. Right? So as much as possible, the, the most efficient way of doing this is to try and give uh, the sensors the ability to, uh, to process things on their own. And this is not a new concept, right? I mean, 30, 40 years ago, you had mainframe computers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were what, what big data computing is today. And you have PCs that sort of evolved from that. Right? Mm -hmm. Why would you want a, a central PC to handle all of your data? You have these small uh, uh, personal computers at home that can actually do your local computing. And you only use the storage when you need to. So it's the same concept. Uh, it was picking up in IoT. And we thought it was uh, a really interesting development for us and we knew from a uh, from a sensor point of view what we could do and couldn't uh, so that was really important for us to be able to combine embedded uh, systems knowledge with software and uh, the the area that we went after was the remote monitoring piece. so so if i were to take that and so now you see you've come up with your brilliant idea of how to change the world right or at least make it better but you have the idea you're working, uh, you know, working in a big company. You decide I'm going to spin out on my own, and you know, walk me through a little bit. So, how did that go? So, you you had the idea, and you and you, you did it go successful, and you just were all all uh, roses from there, or how did the spin out go when you finally decided I'm going to do something without the backing of a big business, full startup, full, you know, going all that direction? How did that go for you? No, I was pretty convinced, as I said, that the idea would work. Uh, it was a question of then proving whether uh, the, the thesis was, was actually correct. Right? So we had to come up with some sort of an application. I was the only one at the time, so I was a sort of a solo founder. Uh, mm. There were a few people that knew about what I was doing, but essentially it was, I was out on my own for the first year and a half or so. Um, so I, I built the initial prototypes on my own. We needed a way to actually test it. Mm. So, uh, so we, we actually tested our initial vibration and motion control algorithms on a tennis racket in a cricket bat. Um, so just wanted to see if uh, if that would work. Um, there were some sort of mixed results, but essentially we we thought we had a a decent uh, uh, starting point at least for doing vibration analytics on, uh, on on industrial equipment. So the sports thing had a limited market, so we sort of left that pretty quickly and moved on to industrial. So on the industrial side, uh, again, I spent till about the 2017 timeframe just coming up with the uh, uh, with the prototype. We got some initial traction in the oil and gas space. So we did some pilots uh, in, in the energy market. And then 2018 is really when we started to take off. So it started scaling quite nicely. We won a few uh, startup competitions. So there was one uh, by Vodafone, which really uh, gave us a, a really nice so, I'm, I, I, I know I keep interrupting. It makes it hard to keep the flow, but I'm going to jump in. So you did the you, 2015, you spun out on your own. You, yeah. For about the first year and a half, it was just you building the prototypes, working yeah. in your basement or your garage or wherever it may be, you know, or the workbench or that, but doing it on your own. And then, and then kind of after that year and a half, did it start, did you start to bring people on? Did you start, you know, how did you, if you, because I think when we talked about before, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're in about three years of R&D, right? If, and right. so it took a, a good, uh, you know, and, and that's not unheard of by any means if you're doing some technology and some sensors. But it's a, a good period of time. But it sounds like about halfway through that R and D is when you started to bring people on. So one, if you didn't have a product and you didn't have you know cash flow, so to speak, how did you convince people to bring on? How did you fund it? And how did you kind of get or ramp that up over the the three year R and D course? Yeah, we, we are a bootstrap company. I mean, we uh, um, I essentially funded the development. 
uh, mm. for, for a number of uh, months and years. And once we got it to a point where it was functioning, we had something to show a customer or uh, a prospective employees, then we went and started finding people that were like-minded, that wanted to work for this company, uh, mm. worked essentially for equity uh, to begin with. Mm. Uh, so we found uh, a few people that sort of had the same idea that edge computing could work and, and we could do something really special here on, uh, on sort of bringing intelligence to the sensor. So uh, yeah, found found some good people initially that helped us out. So they were initially contractors. They did some work for us. We uh, uh, mm. brought some people on in India. Um, I had connections there back to uh, sort of going back to my days uh, at Admiral India. Um, so it was nice to have a network in India to, to mm. lean on. Um, so from a startup point of view, the burn rate was uh, was manageable. So I was able to fund it for a few more months. And in uh, 2018, a couple of people that I knew from my Atmel days decided to, uh, to put some money in. And uh, we sort of scaled the growth at that point. And then back to the 2018 story I was telling, uh, we, we started getting some traction from uh, a couple of startup competitions. And, and, uh, and, and we won a, won a few events, got a grant from the Australian government to build something uh, through different sources, you know, just that, that kept us going. Finally started uh, bringing in revenues in the Q4 of uh, 2018, so about a year and a half ago. And we did so well last take, year. So you take almost three years before you really got, I mean, you did do some, and by no means putting down, you got some grants, you did some competitions, but you were bootstrapping it for almost three years. Did you ever kind of, during that period of, you know, three years, in one sense, it can go by quickly. Now, the other sense, when you're, you know, day, you know, it's kind of the old saying, you know, the days go by slow, the months go by quick, or the years go by quick, right? And so, yeah. did you ever get in a point where, hey, I'm now three years into this, I'm bootstrapping it, we, you know, we think it's a cool idea. Do you ever have those days where you're saying, hey, did, did I make the right decision, or did, did I, you know, make the wrong decision, or did I put all this time, money, and effort, and I want, you don't know if it's going to work out? Did you ever have those kind of worries or was it always just i know this is going to work and i'm always going to take it forward and it's going to be successful I'm, yeah I'm, I'm pretty optimistic in general i mean I, I always knew that that we would get this to work it's a question of just sort of staying in the game right uh, there, there were different points during the journey the five-year journey where you know, things obviously didn't go as planned and you have your ups and downs as a founder but you just got to push through it and uh, the idea is still valid you, know? you hmm. can see that this is picking up pace in the industry we have a lot of companies focusing on edge computing these days. So we are in the right space and we, we always had sort of conviction that uh, it was the right thing to do. So we just kept going, you know, and uh, things are slowly picking up pace, which is nice. Mm. Uh, the company is, uh, is poised to scale nicely. So I, I think we made the right call and hung in there. So I'm not going to get away, let you get away with it quite as easy. So you said you had your ups and downs. So what were some of the ups and downs over five years? Because I know you always hear... You know, and I'm reading a really great book right now, and it's uh, kind of the the found up or the story of Amazon, and you know how they got founded and everything. And then, you know, you look at Amazon today, and they're ginormous. You can buy anything on Amazon. Everybody knows them, and yet, you know, that wasn't the case back. And you know, he had I was reading in you know Bezos, and founder of Amazon, and he would go around and as he was asking for people for money and that. And, you know, he originally started with his parents and asked for friends and family and kind of got started out and bootstrapped it. He'd always tell all of his investors, hey, there's a 70% chance this is going to fail. And so, and, you know, obviously Amazon, it all worked out or it's, it's worked out so well so far. But, it, you know, even over that, and you always hear that, you know, too often you think of the highlights, you know, kind of that overnight success, 10 years in the making sort of a thing. Or in your case, a few, or three years in the making. But what yeah. were some of those kind of ups and downs or things you had to deal with? I think working with industrial companies, you just have to have a lot of patience. Right? That's that's the main uh, uh, issue. Uh, you have traditional industries that are used to working at a certain pace. Mm. Uh, and we are here in Silicon Valley trying to get things done as quickly as possible. So those two things don't always uh, mix well. So when you're working with an oil and gas company that has a procurement process that takes three months, right? that's just fill, you filling out forms to even get in the door. So mm. Those are the types of, of hurdles that you face when you're working with, uh, with large industries. Um, so th those are the typical challenges. Uh, so on, on, the, on the positive side, I mean, you get a little bit of traction with one and you have a case study that you can go show other customers. So once it gets going, it, there's, there's a lot of momentum that can build up quickly. Mm. I think the, the challenge really is getting into an industry and establishing yourself as a small company. I think that's the most challenging part. So it, it, you're almost saying, you know, the best thing you can do is find that one, I guess, anchor customer or anchor client or someone that can 
help you to prove out your technology or your product and that. And then it makes it easier to then for the next customer to point back and say, hey, we've done it once, we can do it again. They found it there and they're happy and those type of things. Is that a fair, a fair summary? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think finding that first case study is extremely important. And this is especially true for these B2B type of companies, like enterprise companies. Uh, and once you've proven that you can monitor a pump, I mean, a pump is a pump, right? You can mm. use that in, in an oil and gas uh, application or, or mining or, or anything else really. And, and that's really valuable. So getting that first customer takes, you know, up to a year, year and a half in some cases. But once you break through and have that case study, then it becomes a lot easier. Well, cool. So no, I, that makes great sense. So then if I just, so now you, so you finally made it through the R&D stage, five years in, you got your startup up and going, or I don't know, I don't know when, to, I never quite know when it moves from startup to small business, to medium side business always kind of blurs together and it always feels like you're forever still in a startup mode, even if you're years in because you always are wanting to make sure it's successful. But you got things past the R&D stage, got things going. Where's the next six months or a year take you? So I, I think we're ready to scale now. So we're starting to build uh, different types of ecosystems around our product. So mm. in, in one sense, we are, a, we are a sensing monitoring company, but we need some sort of partnership with a, with a wireless company, for instance, to actually send the data between uh, or from a sensor to the cloud. So we we're establishing partnerships in that area. We're mm -hmm. trying to bring in uh, additional channel partners. So we're trying to see if we can work with uh, a domain expert in say Maritime for instance, right? And uh, try to bundle our, uh, our monitoring service with their consulting service. So we're trying different business models to try and scale the business. Um, so that's basically where we are today. Uh, we've got a pretty decent product market fit, I think. There are a certain class of customers and applications that seem to uh, understand what we do well. And for that particular niche, I think we are a really good product and we're pretty unique in the market. So uh, it's a question of us trying to scale the business now. So that's the goal for the rest of the year and next year. All right. So you're saying, hey, we've, we've proven out the product. We started to land our customers and now we've got to we've got to scale it and, and take it to the next level. So, OK, yeah, cool. Absolutely. So as we reach it towards kind of the end of the podcast, I'm going to jump to maybe the last couple of questions I always ask at the end of the podcast. So I'll ask them to you now. So the first question I always ask is uh, what's the worst business decision you ever made? It's, it's only a half an hour podcast, right? Uh, so we, we could be here for a while, uh, made it made tons of mistakes in the, in the last four or five years. But I, I think the one that, uh, that sort of has the potential to impact your business uh, the most is any sort of hiring decision. So I think you just have to be really careful about who you bring on, especially in the early stages of a business. So that's probably the, the best advice. Try and work with people that maybe uh, you've known for a while that uh, you can sort of implicitly trust and, uh, and grow the business together. So you as a founder can focus on the, the strategy and, and uh, the targets for the business. Uh, so that I think is, is probably the, the best advice I can give uh, any aspiring founder. So just uh, bring in the right people. So, but then the mistake would you got to go back to the mistake. So the mistake is, is that you hired the wrong people at some point or you hired people that you didn't, or weren't for the right position. Is that, am I reading into that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, all of the above, right? So you, you bring in people uh, knowing what they've done in the past and it mm -hmm. doesn't always translate to a startup, right? So that's one kind of uh, an error that, uh, that I've made in the past. The mm -hmm. other is sort of, Putting people in, in wrong roles, it, uh, there may be people that are a bit more uh, suitable for customer facing roles uh, as opposed to internal sort of development type of roles. So you just have to be a little bit uh, careful and cautious about where you, um, uh, you, you put people in and what, are they, what type of people and what their uh, sort of long term ambitions are when you bring uh, somebody on board. Um, so that, that's, um, that's something that, that that type of learning actually started a number of years ago. So I, mm. Hopefully I've learned from some of the mistakes I've made on, uh, on Intel's or Atmel's time uh, going back 10 years. But I think that's, that's one that sort of sticks with you for a while, I think. So uh, you know, going back and 10 always, years. And I, no, yeah. and I'm in complete agreement. I always look at, you know, it's a, even when it, with your, within a company and you're helping making higher decisions and everything else, you always, it's a much different seat to sit in when you're fully on your own making the decisions and you have to and deal with the reper repercussions, right? And so, and I, you know, one of the things that it was, at least for me with hiring that I, it took me a while to figure out was that you always, you know, as a startup, as an entrepreneur, as someone that's driven and wants to get things done, 
you just kind of automatically assume that everybody else is that way, right? That everybody else will work hard. They'll stay the late nights. They'll do the, they'll do whatever it takes to get, make things successful. And that's not always the case across the board, right? Some people are wired that way and others are just saying, Hey, I'm, I'm here for nine to five and I'll get the job done. But as soon as that clock strikes, I'm out. Some people will say, I don't want to be an entrepreneur. I just want to do my work, keep my head down. And so I think to your point that, you know, making the, let's get the people in the right roles, making the right decisions is, is a valid point and a good lesson to learn. So that almost yeah. dovetails into my second question I always ask, and you kind of already answered it, but I'll, I'll get a different answer or we'll get the next point, which is, so if you're getting someone that's wanting to get into a startup, wanting to get into a smart, small business, or just getting started, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give them? Or if it's already given it on hiring, what would be the next piece of advice you'd give them? <laughs> no, I think you should just do it. I mean, there, there are, uh, People that uh, I'm, I'm sure have, uh, especially here in Silicon Valley, have the ambition to start something on your own. Right? You're sort of in a very friendly environment. It's an environment that's very forgiving. Um, if you uh, make a mistake, you always have the opportunity to go back and, uh, mm. and do something else. So, uh, yeah, don't, don't pass up a chance. If you have a good idea that's worth pursuing, I think you should take the plunge and, uh, and uh, I wish everyone the best. Perfect. Well, yeah, that's, that, that's great advice. So I think that's certainly something people should keep in mind as they're wanting to get going in a startup. So as we reach the end, so people want to reach out to you, they want to connect, whether they want to use your product, they want to invest in your company, they want to partner up or do anything of the like, what's the best way to reach out or get connected with you? Yeah, if, if you want information about the company, I think the, the website's pretty current. So flick.com, F-L-I-C-Q.com. Hmm. And uh, just send me a note. Uh, and th there's an email uh, button there right at the bottom. So just send me a note and I'm happy to chat. I'm also active on LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, just search for Flick and uh, just connect with me. Happy to, uh, ha happy to chat, happy to connect and, and uh, look forward to connecting with people soon. Perfect. Well, I appreciate that. And we'll, we'll direct everybody to go to Flick, check everything out and get uh, learn a little bit more about everything. Well, I appreciate you coming on to the podcast. It's been fun to talk about your journey, about how things have gone for you, where you're headed, and, and uh, wish you all the best of your luck on your journey. Um, for those of you that are uh, looking to or would like to tell your journey and like to come on the podcast, you can certainly go to inventivejourney.com and apply to be a guest on the podcast. Um, for those of you that are uh, needing help with uh, patents or trademarks or any intellectual property, feel free to reach out to myself at uh, Miller IP Law and we're, we're here to help and uh, to make sure that uh, you're taken care of. And uh, don't first, uh, forget to subscribe to uh, catch uh, this episode of the podcast as well as many others. And you can catch us on uh, whichever platform works for you and make sure to subscribe. Thank you again for coming on. It's been a great time. It's been fun to talk about your journey and wish you all the best in, in your, uh, as your journey continues. Thanks, Dylan. Stay safe, okay? Thanks for having me on.